The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next speaker is Eric Kohler, a senior R&D engineer with Verify LLC in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's going to talk to us about an aggregate uh, suspension mixture proportioning method. Okay, everyone. So, good afternoon, and today I'm going to talk about a new method of designing mixes that is an alternative to ACI 211.1. Um, and, and actually, uh, I'm in the process of working with ACI 211 to incorporate this as a as a uh, new tech note uh, that should be available in, in the future. Um, and and, and uh, so what I'll do this morning is I'll talk about why we need a new method, why why ACI 211 needs to be updated. Uh, then I'll go through the method itself and then I'll talk about the, um, and then I'll show an example. So first of all, why do we need a new method to design concrete? So a lot has changed uh, and, and we're talking today about concrete proportioning for the 21st century. So what are the things in the 21st century that are going to be prevalent that we need to incorporate into our mixed design methodology? So things that are becoming more prevalent first is combined aggregate creating. So uh, if you think about ACI 211, they do the coarse aggregate first, the fine aggregate is, is one of the last steps, but we really need to be thinking about those together. There's a lot of specs, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in combined aggregate creating. As David just talked about, there's non cementitious filler, um, or maybe cementitious filler, depending on depending on uh, whose opinion you ask. So uh, whatever we call it, it's ground limestone, it's mineral filler, it's being used more and more in concrete. There's new types of concrete like SEC and Proteus. Uh, there's the use of concrete rheology, so going beyond just slump to characterize the rheology. Uh, concrete mixes today are over-designed, and, and uh, we need a method that helps us to reduce the over-design. We need specifications that allow us to reduce the over-design, um, and that has a big effect on sustainability. So that's our green leaf there. Um, and then we have the ability to get real-time data on the concrete as it comes in. So we can have sensors on a truck. They're telling us exactly how that concrete is performing in real time. And we can know every single truck how that concrete mix is performing. We've got this data and we should be using it to develop our mix designs. So the method that I'm going to talk about today is the aggregate suspension method. And um, this is a method that I uh, worked on developing. Uh, it's based on a lot of other work done by other researchers, so it's certainly not my mine alone. Um, and we're now looking at it in ECA 211. And basically the concept is we think about our aggregate. So all our aggregate are fine, our intermediate, our coarse aggregate, and it's really a suspension of that aggregate in cement paste. So we have two fractions. We have the aggregate fraction and we have the paste. And so we're going to optimize both of them and, and then put them together. So if you go through step by step, we have our we first select our combined aggregates. We fill that with a volume of paste based on the, the aggregate characteristics. And then we adjust the composition of that paste to get the workability and the hardened properties that we desire. And so again, I mentioned I, I worked on this uh, and, and developed it and, and uh, originally published in 2007. Uh, it's been adapted. Uh, it was originally for SEC. We adapted it to conventional concrete, and ACI 211 is in the process of uh, developing a tech note based on it. And some of the key differences, I'll point out four. Uh, the first is that, if, as I mentioned before, ACI 211 does the coarse aggregate first, the fine aggregate last, and there's a bunch of steps in between. So what this method does is it gets all the aggregates together at once, and it optimizes the aggregate creating for your, for your application. Um, in ACI 211, we, we select the mortar volume. Um, in, in this method, we do the paste volume. Uh, 
ACA-211 doesn't take into account ground, ground limestone or mineral filler. Uh, this method uh, accounts for that. Um, and then ACA-211 looks at primarily total water content. And in this method, we introduce the concept of a water to powder ratio in addition to the water to, to cementitious material ratio. And that's what we look at for, for strength. So some quick definitions that I'll use, uh, use these terms quite a bit. So I want to make sure that we're all uh, clear and consistent on these. So pace volume is the volume of the, the water and the powder. The powder is all the solid materials finer than the 75 micron uh, so size, so that's cement, SCMs, limestone filler, mineral filler, it's all considered powder, and then the aggregates are everything coarser than that. So that's where we draw the line is at 75 microns. So here's the method. There's nine steps, and I'll go through each of these nine steps. Um, so uh, you'll see up across the top, we've got the bar, what phase we're in, so are we doing our aggregates, our pace, the near volume, or our pace and our composition. So first, we select maximum aggregate size. And here, we can use the ACI 318 uh, recommendations uh, that are well known, well established. We will always want to get the largest aggregate size as practical for the application, because when we do that, we get higher packing density, lower plastic viscosity, higher slump and slump flow. The only reason we would limit that would be, again, related to the application, so for segregation or passing ability. Next, we select the combine aggregates, and so we want to look at two things. We want to look at the grading and the shape. So for the grading, there's two graphs we can look at to pick out the right grading. And again, there's not an optimal grading. It depends on the, the, the individual application. But the first is the Power 45 curve. And one thing that's very important that I want to, want to really emphasize on the Power 45 curve is that because we've drawn the line between the 75 micron um, being uh, less than 75 micron being powder, greater than being aggregates, when we, we look at combining our aggregates, so everything greater than the 75 micron, we need to draw this this uh, this line on here to the 75 micron set. We don't do it to the origin. Uh, I, I see a lot of times people will use a chart where it's, it, this is this is a line and it's no longer a straight line and they, they make it curved and they make it bent and, and uh, it's, it's a misuse of, of the, the table. It's, it's, it's an empirical misuse of the table. The, the, the correct way to do it is to draw the power 45 curve from the 75 micron to the maximum size. So again, the si we construct this chart by looking at percent passing, but compare it to the sieve size raised to the 0.45 power. So you always want power 45 curve or finer, and that will give you a um, uh, well-packed aggregate. And then the other, the other is the percent retain chart, and you're placing the 818. And again, people have taken the 818, and they've made a bunch of modifications to it and drawn lines here and there. and Really what you're looking for is um, uh, greater than 10% and less than 35% retained on any two consecutive sieves. Um, and that'll give you a good uniform distribution and, and take care of, of uh, a lot of issues that you might have with the gap grading. That said, I have to emphasize, gap grading is not always a bad thing. In fact, gap grading will help increase your, your packing density, um, but it will increase segregation. Um, so uh, you can do tests and you can see that the viscosity is lower with the gap grading. And if you need that and you're okay with it, you can deal with the segregation and other means, gap grading is an okay way to go. But generally, we'd, we'd rather stay with our 10 to 35%. The next thing is the shape angular texture. And I'll talk in the next slide. I mean, generally, we all know well-shaped aggregates will, uh, natural aggregates will give us better workability. Rough angular aggregates will give us better strength. We'll characterize that in step three. So I've got my aggregate gradation picked out. I've got my aggregate selected. I need to know how much paste goes in there. So I need to know my voids, because I'm going to fill those voids with paste. So uh, I measure the dry rotted bulk density from ASTM C29. So this is the, the, the test that we all use quite, quite commonly for fine aggregate and coarse aggregate to determine the, the bulk density of those materials. You actually use that in, in 211 for coarse aggregate. This method, again, we're looking at all the aggregates together. So we're going to test them all together in this, in this method. And then based on this, we have an equation where we can calculate the percent voids of, of that aggregate. So the more the voids, the more paste we're going to need later on. The shape angularity factor, then, is just a, an indication of shape. And we're going to use this term later. But basically, um, uh, if you've got a well-shaped natural aggregate, it's a, it's a 1. If you've got something that's highly angular, very uh, it's a crushed material, it's a 5, um, and then you've got in between. So you want to characterize it on a scale of 1 to 5. You, you, you can do this visually. It's good enough for the, the first approximation. 
Um, and so here's how we calculate the pace volume. So we have an equation, um, and basically what we're doing, if we think back to that earlier chart, we've got to fill the voids between the compacted aggregates, but that's not enough. We also have to separate the aggregates and, uh, we, and, and provide some volume, some extra pace volume there so that the, that the particles can move past each other. And so we do that based on the shape angularity factor. Um, so the higher that, that, that number, the worse the shape, the more pace we need to have. Um, and you can pick the number off of this chart and then put it in the equation. Next, we need to select the uh, maximum water spent ratio and the powders for our hardened property. So ASA211 or historical data is a good source of that information to pick the water spent ratio. Of course, we all now know that water spent ratio is not the only factor that controls durability. And you need to look at your SCMs and, and, uh, and set those based on historical data. Freeze-thaw durability, again, not the air content you need for different exposure is no different. Um, and then, uh, so we talked, we, we picked out our water spent ratio, which is for strength. Water spent ratios aren't really for workability. The water to powder ratio is for workability because the water to powder ratio is, 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 is telling us how much solid material we have, how much water we have. That's really, um, along with this, the shape and the grading of the, the powders, is telling us the workability. So when we compare different mix designs, we want to be comparing the water to powder ratio um, for the um, for, for workability. So if we don't have cementitious materials, so we don't have uh, non cementitious materials, if we don't have limestone or mineral filler um, in that mix, then our water to powder ratio is simply equal to our, our water cement ratio. And then we're going to be adjusting our admixture to get the right slump. Uh, on the other hand, if we do have non cementitious materials, then our water to powder ratio will be less than our water cement ratio. And that's important to keep in mind because you can say, well, I have the same water to cement ratio in both of these mixes. Why do I have lower workability in the mix that has a limestone filler in it or a, a mineral filler? Why do I need to have a higher admixture dose for these for these, uh, these mixes? And it's because of the water to powder ratio. You have to track the water to powder ratio for, um, for workability. So we'll see that later. So at this point, we, we have all the information we need to do the calculations of the volumes and weights of all our ingredients. So we'll go, um, go through. I'll, I'll spare you all the, the, the math this morning and the equations, but, but uh, we now have enough information to do this calculation. Um, and uh, we're doing this. This is mixed design for the 21st century, so it's very easy to do this in software. Um, and then, like any mix design method, this is a first approximation. And, and hopefully, it's a better first approximation than some other methods, but it's still an approximation. Um, and you have to do uh, adjustments. And so uh, there's recommendations here on, on how to adjust um, depending on what, what kind of uh, properties you observe in the trial batches. So that's the method. Um, it's, it's nine steps. It's about the same length as ACA211. Um, so let's look at an example. So we want to design a 4,000 PSI mix, uh, four-inch slump. Um, we have one-inch spacing between the three bars. We have a crushed limestone, coarse aggregate, natural sand, uh, fine aggregate. Uh, we have uh, cement and flash available to us, and we have no freeze uh, exposure. So if you go through the steps, um, step number one is I'm going to select my max aggregate size just like I would uh, previously. So I'm going to select three quarters of an inch. Um, I'm going to select my combined grading. So you can see here I have my power 45 uh, chart here. So I have my sieve size raised to the 0.45, my percent passing. I just draw a line uh, from the number 200 sieve to the maximum size, which is three quarters. And you can see I've got a pretty close fit uh, on this line as I balance those out. So I'm not going to get perfect on this line, but uh, given the, the, uh, the aggregates available to me, I'm going to get as close as I possibly can, or finer, which would be to the left of, of the curve. And then I look at my percent retain chart, and this checks out on my, my 10 and 35 rule. So I have a good aggregate grading. Now I need to figure out um, how how much pace I need. So I need to figure out my voice content. So I do my dry rotted blood density that combine aggregates, and I find that I have 125 pounds per cubic yard from the HCMC 29. I calculate my voids based on that as 23.8%. Um, and then I take my shape and angularity factor. And so my coarse aggregate was a crushed limestone, so I'm going to call that a 5 uh, based on a visual assessment. And my fine aggregate was a 1. Based on the ratio that I have, I'm going to say I have 3.4 for the combined uh, material. So based on that, I'm going to plug my information from step three into my equation in step four, and it's going to tell me that I need a 29.1% pace volume. So I'm going to round that up, give myself some, some robustness, and we're going to say 30% pace volume is what we need. 
Um, and so now um, I'm going to go in and select my water cement ratio. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use ACI 211 um, and say that I need a water cement ratio of 0.57 to get my, my 4,000 PSI. And I'm going to use 25% fly ash in this mix um, to assure durability and economize the mix and improve this, the sustainability. So the next thing I'm going to do is select the air content. There's no air, so I'm going to assume uh, 2%. And then um, my water powder and I mixture dosages, um, because I'm not using any non non cementitious materials, I'm going to have uh, my water cement ratio equal to water powder, and I'm just going to adjust my add mixture to get the slump that I desire. So now I do my calculations. I get my, my mix designs. You can see here um, I have about 387 pounds of cement, 130 pounds of fly ash, um, 294 pounds of water. Um, and so I go back and evaluate um, problem mixes and, and, and make adjustments. So if I need to adjust my slump, I can adjust my admixture dose. If I find that there's bleeding segregation associated with that admixture dose, then I'm going to need to go back and adjust the, the case volume or the water to powder ratio. Um, and then I want to check that my compressive strength is achieved. Um, and so that, that's, the, that's the, the methodology. Um, so one other thing I mentioned earlier was the fact that we have real-time data on concrete. Or we have the capability to pull real-time data from uh, from a concrete truck and know exactly what's happening and exactly how our mix design is performing. And, and there's a number of systems available that can measure, manage, and record concrete in a truck. Um, and and these, this technology allows us to put sensors on the truck. We can measure the slump, the temperature, the mixing, the time, the load size, water and admixture. Um, and we can adjust. So we can adjust our mix design in real time. Um, you can see here, uh, this is a typical delivery cycle where the, we have our, our slump and our target slump. When the, we, as we record the slump, uh, slump is below target. We can add water. We can add admixture. We can adjust that mix. And then um, we can also get that data in real time um, and make further adjustments uh, to the batch rates. Um, and so we know right away how our mix is, is performing, and we can utilize that uh, to optimize our mixes. And, and hopefully, by reducing the variability, by better controlling the mixes during delivery, and by by having data on that mix design, we can reduce the over design. So we have less cement uh, in that mix and improve the sustainability of the mix. Um, but there's some limits to, to being able to use this technology. So we have prescriptive standards that that um, limit have things like minimum cement content and maximum cementitious materials that prevent us from reducing the cement, um, even though we have the cap capability to do that. And then the submittal process requires us to lock in a mix design essentially and, and only make limited changes to that. So the fact that we have the technology to make a, a, a common sense and, and, and well-justified change to a mix design uh, means that we need to kind of rethink uh, how that submittal process works. When we, have the, when, we, when we have the data and we have the capability to, to properly make the mix design changes. So with that, I uh, wrap up, and I don't know if you have time for questions or we want to move on. I, I have three. Uh... Thank you, Eric.